Hi, this is Randy Wyckoff, the Dean of the College of Public Health at East Tennessee State University. And I want to address a question that came in from a good friend of mine. And I think it's an important one. And that is, what is herd immunity? So let's start with a couple of definitions and concepts. First of all, what is immunity? Well, immunity is the ability of an organism, in this case, a human being, to resist a particular infection. Uh, and basically, one gets immunity normally one of two ways, so there are four ways one can be immune. One is following a natural infection. I get a disease, then I'm immune to it after that. Uh, following a vaccine, I get a vaccine, I'm not going to get the disease. The two less common ways is you can get a transfer of antibodies from one person to another. And then mothers pass protection to their unborn babies. But for most purposes, we're going to focus just on the first two. So a concept, oh, and then herd immunity is the idea that a sufficiently large portion of a community is immune, can't get infected. And that prevents this person to sp person spread of that disease. And how does one get herd immunity? By widespread natural infection or widespread use of a vaccine. So let's show a little bit here. Say you have 100 people, all of whom are susceptible, none of them are immune, and an infectious disease arrives. A number of people, many people, will get infected. They then will infect others, now shown in green, secondary infection. And so it goes until most people are infected. Now, how fast a disease spreads, how many people get exposed are, are different for different diseases. And you may hear of a concept called r naught. And the idea of an r naught is the, it represents the number of people that one infected person will transmit the disease to. So if you have one person who spreads it to one person who spreads it to one person, you're not getting a great deal of uh, expansion of the disease. If one person can infect 10 people, it's going and those 10 each infect 10, it's going to grow very quickly. So for example, you have diseases like measles and chickenpox where a lot of people get infected. It spreads very quickly, very rapidly. You have diseases like polio that are sort of middle of the ground. COVID-19, the CDC uses 2.5. You may see estimates from 2 to 5. This means, on average, somewhere between 2 and 3 people will get infected for each person who has COVID-19. And then Ebola is a little bit less than that. So let's take our 100 people again, all of whom are susceptible. But now let's vaccinate 75% of them. All right? Now they are immune. And when the disease strikes, it will infect a few people. But then in this case, only one secondary infection because basically most of those who are not immune are protected. We have in essence developed herd immunity and the disease stops spreading. So as I mentioned, there are two ways to get herd immunity from widespread natural infection or from widespread use of a vaccine. When it comes to COVID-19, some people have said, well, why don't we aim for herd immunity by widespread natural infection? In other words, letting everyone get the disease. Well, there are a couple of challenges with this. According to the experts, we need to have about 70% of the population immune, either from vaccine or from natural infection, in order to achieve herd immunity for COVID-19. In the United States, that would mean about 220 million cases. Currently, the CDC estimates that the death rate for COVID-19 is a little over one half of 1%. That translates into 1,300,000 deaths that we would expect if we sought to achieve herd immunity through natural disease. Of course, we'd have to add to that all the folks would be hospitalized, all of those would develop chronic illness, both heart disease and lung disease. And we're still not sure exactly what the long-term consequences of COVID-19 are, even on young and healthy people. We have to add to that that we're not even sure that SARS-CoV-2 provides natural immunity to everyone, nor how long the immunity lasts. And if the virus mutates like the seasonal flu, then we might have to develop natural immunity every year. So if we gamble on developing herd immunity from natural disease, the consequence would likely be increased deaths among our elderly and among those with chronic disease, as well as a tremendous burden on our healthcare system and unknown consequences for those who have been infected. And I think we as a society 
have to ask the question, is this a gamble we should take? Are we willing to go this approach as opposed to encouraging things that we believe and in some cases know can help, like masks, good hygiene, social distance, avoiding large groups, and so on? Now, obviously, this is my own interpretation of the data, and as always, I know that I might be wrong. If and when new or contradictory information is available, I'll be glad to share it. But for the moment, this is my take on herd immunity from natural disease. There's a great deal more information about COVID-19 on the College of Public Health website. If you'd like to be added to our mailing list or know anyone who would, please contact Jan Stork. As always, I'd like to thank Derry Young for editing, producing, and posting this video. And if you have any questions like this question on herd immunity, please let me know. It's important that we, tr that we make sure that we all have a common understanding of what the facts show so that at any given time, we can take the best action that we can. Thank you very much.